Albertans will be going to the polls to either keep or choose a new government on May 29th. But will an investigation into her alleged interference into the justice system hurt Premier Daniel Smith's chances of victory this spring? To talk more about this is our legislative reporter and Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, on a federal level, our Prime Minister has faced a number of ethics violations and they more or less have washed off his back, minus losing a few seats in the following election. How could this ethics investigation affect Premier Smith's chances of bringing the United Conservative Party to victory? I think that's a little bit of an open question at the moment. Um, obviously, what's happened here is you've had sort of a number of uh, different sort of explanations from Premier Smith about what she's actually done, who she's spoken to, that sort of thing. And and in the sort of most controversial case, there was a phone call with Pastor Artur Pavlovsky, uh, a, sort of a street preacher in Calgary, who holds, I think it's fair to say, some fairly extreme views. Um, and in this, in this recording, you've Danielle Smith saying that, you know, she's pushing weekly to to figure out what she can do for him and that sort of thing. And that I, so I guess what I'm coming around to saying is where the electoral risk for her might be is less the um, the idea of interference and perhaps more who she's interfering on behalf of or who she's alleged to interfere on behalf of. Now, the ethics uh, investigator is going to be looking into this, the ethics commissioner, I should say, but we don't know when, you know, anything is going to happen, right? You know, this so this information could come in the middle of the campaign, could in theory come once the campaign's finished. Um, but, you know, there's no doubt that the NDP is going to try and make this stick as much as possible um, because it's, it, you know, it's sort of a, it, in some ways it's a nonpartisan thing, you know, it, it's not, quibbling over a policy or something like that. It, it's something that's relatively easy to understand. Um, there's been a lot of controversy over it, so, but it remains to be seen for sure just how much this is going to matter. Now, the Premier's office has said that Smith welcomes the investigation and will, and will co cooperate while being confident that it will determine that she's done nothing wrong. But Alberta's NDP justice critic is calling for a full, in full independent investigation on Smith. Calgary MLA Irfan Sabir says an ethics investigation is not enough. Is this the NDP doubling down or is there significant evidence to suggest that the Premier violated ethics rules? Well, this is definitely the NDP doubling down. You know, I think they probably see some opportunity here. Um, what you would do beyond an ethics investigation, though, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and, and I think probably the, the simplest path for it is to wait and see what the ethics commissioner concludes. You know, if the ethics commissioner concludes that, that Daniel Smith violated sort of ethics rules, well, you know, what further investigation do you need, so to speak? So, it, but but certainly this is them trying to continue making headlines, continue keeping this in the news, continue to sort of bang away on it, um, especially now as the Premier's office is basically not commenting now that this investigation is underway. Now, there's some new polling from Janet Brown that shows the NDP is five points up on the UCP in Calgary, 47 to 42. Many political pundits feel that Calgary is going to be the battleground in this upcoming election. But because of the way the seats are distributed in the province, this could actually be a critical lead for the NDP? It could be, yeah. So there's essentially three groupings of seats in Alberta, and you need to win two of the three. You have Edmonton, you have Calgary, and you have sort of the rest of the province, rural and small town Alberta. The UCP has rural and small town Alberta essentially on a lock, um, and the NDP has a relatively big lead, you might say a lock, on, on most of Edmonton. That leaves Calgary as the place where it's going to be a little bit of a toss-up. Now, a 5% lead is not that big of a lead when you, you know, sort of... Um, consider sort of margins of error and things like that but but it is substantial in the sense that Calgary is a place that the UCP won by a considerable margin in 2019. Um, it is much more seen as the homeland of the Conservative Party than Edmonton is. So there's some sort of symbolic as well as practical importance to all of this. Um, the NDP is going really hard on Calgary. I believe they're going to be putting their election headquarters in Calgary. They're going to be canvassing very, very hard, big get out the vote um, effort there because, um, you know, what they need to win there. But, but what it comes down to is how many seats the NDP need to win in Calgary and how many they can win in Calgary. Because if you have all of Edmonton, you have a bunch of seats in Calgary and maybe one or two elsewhere, Lethbridge, for example, um, that gets them on their way to forming government, but not quite. So they need to win a good number of seats in Calgary and maybe pick up a few more seats outside of Calgary 
as well in order to reach that sort of majority threshold. And there are some other options there. Um, a good example of that is sort of the, the bedroom communities around Edmonton, for example, are a place where they hope that they can pick up some seats. Um, and, and the other thing I should just say is, is that the polling that shows the uh, New Democrats in the lead has also narrowed. You know, the NDP had a pretty substantial lead for the past few years during the pandemic and with, you know, the associated controversies of the Kenny government. So and what the premier's office will tell you is that, well, actually, the, the NDP lead is narrowed, and this is a good sign for the UCP. So, you know, you can sort of spin that um, whichever direction one might like. And But with uh, so many uh, UCP incumbents not seeking re-election, is that also means uh, some concern for the UCP uh, claiming a victory in the next election? Well, it, it could. Um, you know, you are going to lose a little bit of that bench strength, a little bit of um, some of the people who could show up at rallies to build excitement for some of the newer candidates, things like that. Um, will it matter on the ground? You know, I'm not entirely certain about that. You know, it, it really depends where these people have left. Um, you know, Doug Schweitzer, for example, I believe is a Calgary seat, but not everyone is a Calgary seat, right? So, you know, you could run a you could run an old cowboy boot in a couple of ridings in Alberta and they would still win. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter in some of these places who is going to be running for the United Conservatives. Um, even if it's a first-time candidate, they might do very, very well. Even if it's a candidate who was, say, defeated in the nomination process the last time around, they could do very, very well. So, so I don't think that will matter a ton in the election. Probably where that begins to matter a little bit more is if the United Conservatives win the election and then when they get down to the process of forming government, building a cabinet, things like that, who is going to be available? Who are the, the strong candidates, the strong um, legislators who are going to be able to step into some of those roles um, that have been left vacant? Now, Premier Smith was in the Edmonton area hamlet of Sherwood Park this week to reiterate her commitment to public health care. Now, health care has been a long and easy regular attack line for the NDP. What was the Premier's announcement about, and can we expect to see a lot of fighting between the two parties over health care uh, coming up to May 29th? So the announcement was basically a rehash of what Jason Kenney did a couple years ago, and that was the public health care guarantee, saying, you know, no Albertan is going to have to pay for medical services. The government backs public health care. Um, you know, that announcement didn't go all the way to uh, calming some of the fears about Jason Kenney. I, I wouldn't expect it to go that much further for Danielle Smith. Of course, she has mused publicly about um, uh, sort of some different mechanisms of healthcare delivery, you know, so, so it, it's going to be a little bit hard for her to shake that, I think. Um, and the NDP, yeah, there is going to be fighting about it. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, it's been a big issue for Albertans for the last six months, the last few years, the state of the healthcare system. And for better or worse, the United Conservatives have been in government for that time, which means that they have to wear that, they have to own that to some extent. And the NDP have always seen in their polling, in their philosophy, that this is a, a line of attack that they think they can do well on, that they like to use. So, so I do think we're going to see a lot on that. You know, the, the question is, to what extent is the UCP going to fight back on it? What is their strategy going to be to fight back on it? But I think there's, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the NDP are going to talk about it until they're blue in the face. Now, the UCP government is also moving to restrict the ability of local police and municipalities to cooperate with federal fire, firearms rules. Essentially, any agreement to participate in something like a buyback must be approved by the justice minister. So what sort of showdown could this lead to between the federal government and the province? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and it's not totally clear to me exactly what the federal government could do in this situation. Um, you know, could they step in and do this themselves in some fashion? Um, a little bit hard to say. But, you know, this is it's an interesting situation, not just because of the specific firearms issue, but it's an interesting situation because this is sort of a Sovereignty Act light situation. You know, the government hasn't invoked mm -hmm. the Sovereignty Act here, but they are pursuing this strategy that's going to make it a little bit more difficult for the federal government to, to implement its policy agenda in Alberta. Um, and and will that will it work? I have no idea. Um, but but certainly, you know, with an election on the way, firearms owners by and large, I expect, UCP supporters, um, there's a little bit of uh, political support, support to be gathered there, I think. And um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. And, you know, it, and I don't even think that these buybacks, for example, are planned at the moment. Maybe they are, and I just haven't heard. But, you know, it, it's not like this is kiboshed, uh, you know, a buyback program this weekend kind of thing, as far as I know, anyways. <laughs> 
So you brought up the, the Alberta Sovereignty Act, and I wanted to uh, go down that vein a little bit more because uh, obviously the NDP have been really opposed to this. But uh, should the NDP form government, could they actually be using the Sovereignty Act to push things that, uh, that, they, may, that they, they may want, like such as like BC pushing safe drug supply? Could you see the NDP using the Sovereignty Act for that before they revoke it? No, I, I couldn't see that. You know, in, in theory, they could try and use it, I think. Um, but I, I think the political blowback from their supporters and the political reaction from their opponents um, would be too sort of severe for them to bother with it. I, I think that, you know, in the time that Rachel Notley was premier versus Jason Kenney and Danielle Smith as premier, we, we have seen a relatively different approach in the management of the relationship with the federal government. I think it's safe to say that the NDP has been a little bit more conciliatory, a little bit less confrontational. And, and I don't see any reason why they would um, they would really change that, uh, you know, especially if it was on something particularly controversial, you know, that you're probably better off trying to catch more flies with uh, honey than vinegar, as the as the cliche goes. Absolutely. Now, the Alberta government is funding 100 new police officers in Edmonton and Calgary at a cost of $15 million. This is likely in response to fears of increased criminal activity on the streets of Alberta's two largest cities. Is this part of the UCP's attack on the NDP? Because last week, the UCP sent out a media release attacking Rachel Notley and some of her, quote, anti-police candidates. Yeah, you know, it, that's a really interesting sort of dynamic here. Um, the the sort of where the UCP is taking the policing thing. You know, I was a bit surprised when I saw the, the that release um, attacking the NDP for so-called anti-police candidates. Um, you know, I think that's a, it's a bit of a, it's a red meat issue to some extent, I think, for the conservative base, but not something I think think that I've seen in recent times. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, the, the the police officers on the streets thing is, I think, linked to, you know, there was an announcement a few weeks ago now that there, there was going to be Alberta sheriffs on the streets of Edmonton and Calgary to sort of assist with some of the street level disorder, drug crime, property crime, things like that. So I think that's all sort of generally on the same theme that people feel that the streets are, are unsafe, that transit is unsafe and, and are really demanding that the government do something. So, you know, I think there's the upcoming election part of it, um, they, as you pointed out. But I also think there's the straightforward governance part of it. You know, there's this policy problem and this and this um, this law and order problem in, in parts of the two biggest cities. And the government needs to be seen to mm -hmm. be doing something about it, you know, whether there's an election or not. And it's also, I think, to some extent, the sort of policy that you might see the New Democrats put in place. Were they in the same position? Now, the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba have signed a major agreement to collaborate on economic corridor projects to help boost trade and economic growth for Western Canada. What is the goal behind this memorandum of understanding? It's essentially to streamline the development process of infrastructure sort of across the three Prairie Province borders and to sort of give the impression to international investors that the provinces are open for investment, they're open for business, um, that these sort of projects can and will be built here, that sort of thing. Now, this is not a super new idea. Um, you know, if you go back to, I, I think it was probably Andrew Scheer when he was the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, talked quite a bit about economic corridors, um, mainly for, for transporting goods like oil and gas, um, some of the controversial stuff that was, uh, you know, really in the news at the time. Um, and, and it's an idea that's been floating around but never really implemented. Um, and, and honestly, it's a little bit hard to say just how this might work. Because, of course, if we're talking about a road or something like that, whatever, not a super big deal. But, you know, something like pipelines, for example, that's going to need to go through the federal government's um, approval process that, that was created by Bill C-69, which was, you know, quite controversial a few years ago. Um, so in some ways, I... I I do wonder if it's more symbolic than practical. Um, but but it, what it probably does show is that when it comes to some of these projects that are going to end up before these assessment agencies from the federal government, that there is a, a somewhat united political front from the three governments of the Prairie Provinces. Um, and, and I think probably if there's any sort of major benefit of it in the sort of months or years ahead, that I suspect is what the benefit would be. He's our legislative reporter and Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me.